Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first episode of True Tales to Tell in the Dark portion of Dark Softly Tales podcast. I'm your host, Mav, and thanks for chilling with me this evening. How's everyone doing? It's not exactly easy street out there right now, is it? Not for me either. Just remember that we are in this together. And with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the program. So True Tales to Tell in the Dark is an idea I had where once a month, I'd like to take some time and read other people's stories. True stories about mysterious premonitions, coincidences, haunting dreams, or whatever else is on your mind. So far, I've had a lot of interest, excitement, promises to send stories, but no one has actually sent their stories to me. And that's understandable. There's a lot of things going on right now. And I know for myself, I always have intentions to do certain things, like review a book after I've read it, because I could absolutely love a book and completely have the intention to review it, and then I completely forget. However, I completely believe in this audience, and I know that you guys will send me the stories in whenever it's the right time, and it's going to be awesome, and I'm really looking forward to that. So now that I use the word completely three times in a row, Almost three times in a row. I think that's a sign of good luck. Um, In case you haven't noticed, I plan on these episodes being a little bit more relaxed, laid back. I'm also practicing vulnerability in this. I am going to practice not doing as much editing, which, thinking back over what I've just talked about or said, it's like... (laughs) Can I do this? And yes, I can. I can do this. So let's get back on topic. So until we start getting some stories rolling in, I decided to go ahead and fill this time with true scary stories from history. The story that I chose to talk about for this week is actually a time period that inspired a slew of old fairy tales that we still tell to this very day. I'll be reading over a couple of these tales the next few weeks, ending with a story that I wrote that uses a lot of symbology that these stories use, and I'll be talking about this as we go along. But Mav, you may ask, what is the topic of tonight? And the answer to that would be the Great Famine of 1315. So before we get to the famine, let's discuss weather patterns. I know, that's exactly what you wanted to listen to, right? Macabre tales of weather patterns. Without getting political though, this is just history. The years between 950 and 1325 was called the medieval warm period. Side note, there seems to be a plethora of information of when the medieval warm period switched to the little ice age. Some say as late as 1340, but roughly in the same two decades of the famine of 1315. According to Wikipedia, possible causes of the warming period was due to increased solar activity, less volcano activity, and changes to the ocean circulation. Um, from what th- the little research that I did about these weather patterns, it seems like there is kind of a set period of time where the earth warms up for 500 years and then it cools down for 500 years and then it warms up for 500 years and then it cools down for 500 years. So it's kind of a pattern that this follows. So when the weather pattern started after 950, the weather increasingly warmed up and the ice began to melt and the Vikings went on their rampage across the seas. Um, Population exploded in Europe. Crops did really well. 
everything was going pretty good right up to the 1300s. And these poor people, the 1300s, just happened to live at the wrong time. The weather started doing flip-flops, jumping jacks, the whole works. Hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, and then rain. Little did they know that the weather was transitioning from the warm period into the cold one, later called the Little Ice Age, which lasted until about the mid-1800s, which means, yes, right now in 2020, we are in the middle of a warming up period, which means the Earth will continue heating up for the next couple hundred years. It was reported that during the medieval warm period, Alaska was a desert. That tells you something right there about where we may be heading. The Pacific Northwest was pretty steamy as well, sort of like a rainforest jungle. Think of Hawaii. Anyway, rewind back to the spring of 1314. It began to rain. It continued to rain. And rain. And rain. It was a horrible year for the crops, and they simply did not grow in Europe. There was no hay or straw for the livestock. And there were even reports of mass livestock drowning. Everybody was uncomfortable. But fortunately, there were stockpiles of food, and people did mostly fine until the following year, 1315. Spring came around, and it was still raining, which again made crops impossible to grow. Living in Washington State, I can sympathize with these people. It rains a lot here, like a lot. But what these people experienced was far greater than what we experience here. I can't imagine the constant downpour they must have experienced enough to drown the livestock. Just wow. And you know, hear how the docs always encourage us to take vitamin D because we don't get enough sunshine. Lack of vitamin D causes depression, lowers the immune system, causes muscle pain, heart palpitations, insomnia. I know most of these because I have a sun allergy mostly during the summer and my body does not process vitamin D well. I am constantly taking vitamin D and trying to balance out. But these people went chronically without sunshine. And between that and no food? Oh, man. Okay, so around 1315, people were suffering at this point. But they were still creative and resilient and began gathering berries and roots and nuts from the forest to feed their families until the next year... 1316, when all of nature's resources were used up. So I know I called this the famine of 1315, um, but it's really the years of 14, 15, and 16. It seems like all the resources that I was looking at had different year numbers for when things happened. So I just tried to follow it chronologically the best that I could. So 1316 comes around. Lots of rain, the crops still aren't doing well. People are becoming very sick from malnutrition and starvation. Um, a lot of families, unable to feed their children, abandoned their children deep within the forests. Now you need to understand, like in America, we have many kinds of forests here. They're generally open with lots of sunshine coming through. You know, there's some brush in there, but usually you can walk through it or get through it. As I say this, I'm thinking of all the different kinds of woods that I ventured into since a young child. Um, as a kid, the woods were my home. They were my peace. They were my sanctuary. They were my adventure. They spiked my imagination. I felt like I was home beneath a fern bush, buried deep in dead leaves, snacking on red huckleberries, watching snails make their journeys across rocks and tree limbs. I've never been to Europe, so you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, and I very well could be wrong. But at least in the Germany area, I believe that the woods are very dense and very thick, and the trees are so straight and long and close together that the sunlight doesn't pierce through to the floor. It's just very frightening. 
And um, this is why so many fairy tales reference forests being places of fear and the unknown. Entering the woods might as well be like walking down a dark alley at night in Crime Central. You never know who you might meet or who may be waiting in the dark to meet you. Hence the lore about entering the woods and what awaits one in the woods. So for a mother and father to lead their children into a dark forest and then abandon them to their fate, that's uh, pretty bad. Except it wasn't exactly leaving the kids to their fate. Makes me think of um, what happened a lot in the 80s um, when everyone had dogs and the dogs bred with the other dogs and there was always puppies everywhere. Anyone who was born in the 70s, raised to the 80s, you know what I'm talking about. And if someone got a really squirrely puppy, right, like if they got a dog that was just really well behaved, really antsy, um, they didn't want anymore, they would usually take it out in the country and dump it at a farm. Because if left at a farm, most likely a farmer would take in the dog, feed it, and give it a job. I mean, at least that's the hope or the idea. But back then, in the 1300s, if you left your children in the forest, there is no one out there that is going to find those kids and be kind enough to feed them and take them in. Or is there? That is where next week's story is born. You may have heard of it before, Hansel and Gretel. We will read the Grimm Brothers version of it, which you may have never heard before. I'm looking forward to reading that for you. But it gets worse than abandoning children in the forest. There's infanticide. It became a regular occurrence. And then cannibalism. It wasn't unheard of for people to eat their own children. Ugh. Which brings us to the story after next week called The Juniper Tree. If you think Hansel and Gretel is frightening, it has nothing on the juniper tree. Trust me. So, after... 1317, the rain slowed. Crops managed to be raised during the summer. But there was so much damage, so much malnutrition, starvation, just plain despair, that what food that was produced barely made a difference. It wasn't until 1322 that the food supply returned to normal after the Great Famine. So this is kind of bizarre. A Wikipedia article I found, which you can find in the show notes of this program, says, and I quote, According to official records about the English royal family, an example of the best off in society for whom records were kept, the average life expectancy in 1276 was 35.28 years. Between 1301 and 1325, during the Great Famine, it was 29.84 years. Well, between 1348 and 1375, during the plague, it was only 17.33 years. It demonstrates the relatively steep drop between 1348 and 1375 of about 42%. Holy cow! That is so young. And this is for the best off in society. Okay, so this brings us to the next uh, occurrence after the Great Famine. The Black Death. After a slight bounce back from the Great Famine, people are traumatized, trying to get their health back, maybe start growing farms again, babies are being born, and actually surviving. Along comes 1337, when the royalty of the land decide to start a hundred-year war about who gets the right to rule France. W2F, right? Great timing, guys. Oh, and then after a decade into that, 1347 arrives with the Black Death. Da-da-da-da! Talk about a horror story. Okay, so between 1347 and 1351, the Black Death killed off somewhere between a tenth to a quarter of the entire population of Europe. 
So think about this. A famine is like a long, slow torture. The Black Plague was quick. It was a snap. It swept you. It swept. Blah, 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 blah. It swept through, and if you got it, you probably died. Boom. You barely made it through the Great Famine, seeing things that are too horrible to even think of, knowing things that traumatized probably generations of people after you, and then you happen to stay alive through that horrible and stupid war that the rich people started, thinking God wanted them to rule over France just to die from the plague. This blows my mind. Just wow. And for some reason, even after the plague ravaged the continent for five years or so, which must have felt like a hundred years, but the hundred year thing was a hundred year war, and it continued. By the way, if you want to catch a bite of history on the 100 year war, there's a show, it was on Prime for a little while, I don't know if it's still there or not. But it's called The White Queen, and it's about the final truce in 1445. It's absolutely fascinating. I love the show. And um, I'll probably re-watch it again this summer. It's not a kid's show, by the way. It's very adult, so I wouldn't watch it with little ones running around. So why am I telling this story? For several reasons. First is because it's the basis for the next few stories that I will be reading over the coming weeks. And I think context is everything. Second, because we ourselves are right now in a place that is so unknown and almost unfathomable to the modern world. The coronavirus has swept and is sweeping over many continents. This is a very scary and very real reality right now. But, no matter how bad things get, even if it gets as bad as the Great Famine, and then the Plague, and then a Great War, I'd like to point out that humanity pressed on. We rebuilt mighty nations. We abolished slavery. We gave women rights. My brother pointed out to me a few weeks ago that it isn't a question in America if I am my brother's keeper, it's how do we take care of our brother? Do we give to him from the government's collecting funds or do we give privately from our own funds? This is a wonderful problem to have. So yes, humanity has gone through some very dark times and we will continue to dip into those dark times. But from those dark times, wondrous and amazing values are born. There is more love in the world today than there has ever been before. There's a lot of arguing about how to give that love, but it is love nonetheless. Most of the world is working together in harmony right now, and we're sharing information about this virus. And I heard that... um, I I don't remember which, I think it was Taiwan is sending like a bunch of face masks to Italy. I mean, people are sharing resources. We're sending things to each other. We're sharing information. We're sharing knowledge. Um, That's a great thing. It's wonderful. We have amazing technology, amazing minds on this right now. Have people died? Yes. Will they die? Yes. Will the coronavirus affect you and me? Yes, it will affect you and me one way or another. In fact, it already has. Will it infect the economy? Yeah, but it's going to be okay. We are strong, we are resilient, we are resourceful. Hold the course, hold the faith, love your babies, love your friends, families, neighbors, partners, and we're gonna get through this together. And this kind of concludes um, our little chat today about true tales and history. Until next week, we will continue with, um, I think, Hansel and Gretel. I think that's what I have planned. So stay strong, stay safe, and shine bright, dark hearts. Good night.